Today, what I'm going to do is write from scratch a program that has uh, circles bouncing around that you can interact with with the mouse. So we'll cover uh, mouse interactivity, uh, animation a little bit, and simple physics simulation. I'll do everything as I say it. So, Open up index.html and create a basic uh, HTML page. So a basic HTML page means begin HTML tag and end HTML tag. And then begin head, end head. And uh, begin body, end body. So the head contains things that are not visible in the document on the page, like the title. Uh, let's give this page a title. The title is, uh, let's say, Bouncing Circles. And the body contains stuff that gets displayed on the page. So let's just put some text there for now to make sure everything works. So hello HTML. Uh, I'm going to save it and uh, copy my working directory and paste it in the URL bar here. And here it is. Hello HTML. I've set up a system that will create snapshots of my code and then upload them to GitHub in real time. So I'll make the first uh, snapshot. And this is the URL. So if you uh, go to this URL, but if you paste that uh, new UL, URL uh, address, there's a snapshots directory. So if at any point you like fall behind, you can check this. Bouncing Circles is the name of this one. And I've got the first snapshot there, which is just this uh, HTML page. So I've got my basic HTML page outline here. Let's put a canvas on the page. So I'm going to delete that text and put a canvas tag. Begin canvas, end canvas. And uh, to use the canvas tag in JavaScript, you need to give it an ID. So I'm just going to give it an ID, say, my canvas. And then after that element on the page, I'll add a script tag so we can access it and draw things on it. Uh, a script tag contains JavaScript code that will get executed uh, as that element loads on the page. So the basic outline of how you access a canvas is you pull it out of the DOM, the document object model, which is the HTML tree here. So first of all, var can, var, uh, I'll, I'll call it canv, so it's not the same, so it's not confusing because we have a canvas already on the page, equals document, which is the DOM API that's prov provided in the browser, get element by ID. And what should we pass in here? Anybody know? My canvas. Uh, so this gives us access to the, the DOM element, but we need to do one more step to get access to the functions that let you draw things on it. So um, I'm going to make another variable uh, called C, which is uh, canv.getContext 2D. And uh, right here, I'm going to point out a JavaScript convention that I'm going to use for the rest of the time, which is, in general, good practice and recommended. Uh, well, it doesn't really matter. But it looks nicer, and it's a good practice. So I have two var statements. And usually, people just use one. So to do that, 
you can you can change the end of the line here from a semicolon to a comma and then get rid of this var here and align it like this so it's clear okay I'm creating new two new variables here can and C and uh, once I've got those I can call C dot fill rect which is part of the canvas API so if you're if you're ever wondering what functions can I call on the canvas just Google uh, HTML5 canvas spec, and you'll find it. It's a huge document that has all these functions in it. So if, if I want to say, for example, like, what does PhilRec take as arguments? Oh, x, y, uh, width, height in pixels are the arguments. So to, to create a small rectangle on the screen, I'll give it uh, 0, 0, uh, 50, 50. I'll save that and then refresh the page over here. And sure enough, there it is, a small rectangle. So, yeah, question? Uh, you don't really explain what's the get context here. Get, get context? Um, 3D, maybe. You, I think you can put WebGL in there. Oh. I think the reason for this is because the uh, the HTML5 standard reuses the canvas element for 2D graphics and 3D graphics, even though they're totally separate implementations. So to, to use WebGL here, you would do, you would do get context. Uh, I think WebGL. Okay. I'm not sure. You could look it up. Yeah, and. Uh, I'm not sure exactly why they separate it out here, why, why you can't just call functions on the DOM element, but there, I think there's some good reason. I don't really know what it is. Very good. So here's our, here's our page. I'll create a, uh, another snapshot. Notice one thing. This, uh, this is offset a little bit. If I open up the uh, element explorer, we can see that this is the space occupied by the canvas element. And notice that it's not flush up against the corner of the screen. Um, it's just something I prefer to have it flush against the corner of the screen. Uh, like in the case you want to make it full screen, you could actually do it. And uh, so I'll just do that. Uh, the, the way I found that works well for this is to do inline CSS on the body, uh, setting the margin to zero. So that works. So the code we're going to write today is going to get kind of big. So I'm going to separate it out into a different script file. I'm not going to do it all in one document. So to do that, I'm going to make a script called script.js. And I'm going to copy and paste the JavaScript code into here and change the indentation. As a, as a new script? as a new file on disk, okay. yeah, a new text file called uh, script.js. And then once you've done that, update the script tag here, because now it's an empty script tag. It doesn't do anything. Update it with a source attribute. src equals, in quotes, the name of the file, uh, script.js. So I've done that, and uh, oh, something broke. Oh, I didn't save it. I have to save everything, and then okay, there, there we go. It works. How do you tell them to do I'm just using Alt Tab on the Mac. No, to the two split. The two split? Yeah. Oh, so I'm using Vim, and uh, in Vim, to to switch between the windows, it's Control W H to go to the left and Control W L to go to the right, <laughs> which sounds sort of weird and cryptic, but um, it's you get used to it, and it's really efficient.
in the end, in the long run. So is everybody good with index.html? I'm going to close that file so we can just work on the JavaScript. So now we've just got the JavaScript here. And I'm going to uh, move this around so we can see it running and edit it at the same time. So this is how you draw a uh, rectangle. But how do you draw a circle? Uh, so what we're going to try to do today is make a bunch of circles on the screen bouncing around with mouse interactivity. So the first thing is to draw a circle. Um, I happen to know how to do that. <laughs> you can look it up, and you'll get some code that looks exactly like this. Uh, C.beginPath and C.closePath. This, this, uh, this is something common to, to a lot of different kinds of shapes in Canvas. You begin the path, and then you close the path, and then you do whatever operations you want to do to actually make the path visible, like filling, which fills the inside of it, or stroking, which only draws an outline. Um, so inside the begin and close, we put uh, c.arc. And that takes x, y radius, begin angle, and end angle. So uh, just to make the code really clear, I'll make those variables. Uh, var x equals say 50, it's in pixels, and by the way, 0, 0 is the, the upper left hand corner, which is different from math, and increasing y actually goes down on the screen, so just be aware of that. Um, so I'll set x to 50, y's uh, 50, radius, I'll make it uh, 20, and that's all we need to really define the circle. And then we call the arc function uh, when we're defining the path. And we pass x, y, radius. And then the two last parameters are begin angle and end angle. Uh, so to draw a full circle, it'll be 0 and uh, 2 pi. It, it uses radians. So 0, comma, 2 times math dot uppercase pi. So we've defined the path. It's not going to draw anything because uh, we need to call fill. So after we've defined the path, we can call c.fill. And this, this code should draw a circle. Yeah, it does. There we go. So this is snapshot 4, in case you want to update to this. So now what? Uh, we can make the circle fall down, first of all. And uh, <clears throat> to do this, to do any kind of animation with Canvas, it's recommended that we use uh, this function request animation frame, which is a kind of a new technology. So what I'm going to do is look it up online. Request anim frame, because I know there's a uh, a cross-browser compatibility layer that somebody's made for this. And it's just this snippet of code that we can copy and paste. So um, to keep our JavaScript document uncluttered, I'm going to paste this piece of code into the HTML file, into a different script tag. Um, I'll put it in the head. It doesn't really matter where it goes. So I'm just going to paste that code. And what it does is it gives us a new global variable on window. So window is the global object in, in JavaScript, by the way. If you, if you assign a variable, a member to window, it appears as a global variable. So we can use this thing. It's called request nm frame, and what it does is goes through and checks pretty much what browser we're on, and gives you the right implementation depending on the browser. Hopefully, in a couple years, you won't need this when all the browsers sort of uh, converge. But in the meantime, this is what we need to do. So it's there, request nm frame, 
We save this. Hmm. Oh, good call. I didn't close my script tag. I had two opening script tags. Good catch. Now, I feel like I can't see you guys. This is a weird setup. Here we go. Huh? Yeah, I'll do. I'll do that. Oh, once I get it working. So I'll save that and then edit the uh, the script file so we have some animation going. So based on this sample code on uh, Paul Irish's website, this is how you use it. You define a function and then you call request enum frame with a reference to that function, which pretty much says, I want to schedule this function to be executed on the next frame. And the next frame is usually defined by like the graphics hardware, usually 60 frames a second. So the reason why they had to imp implement this uh, new function, request animation frame, is because the old method of setting time, uh, setting a function to execute periodically, the timing wasn't really accurate, so you get these sort of uh, not really smooth animations. So that's the reason for this. So I'm going to make a function uh, called execute frame because we're going to want it to do this thing every frame. And inside this function, well, I want to draw this stuff inside this function. And then uh, after we've drawn the stuff, we want to schedule this function to be called again the next frame. So request enum frame, and we pass it the name of this function, execute frame. So right now the code's not going to do anything because we haven't called the function the first time. But once we call this function once, it will schedule itself to be called uh, periodically, 60 frames a second in the future. So I'll just make a comment, start animation, and then call the function, execute frame. So, can you see the difference? There's, there's no animation because we haven't moved the circle. We should start moving the circle around to see it move. So, before we draw the circle, let's increment the position of the circle uh, a little bit. So, we want it to fall down, right? So, which, which variable should we increment? Y. y. So, c dot y. Oh, it's not C. It's just uh, it's just Y. So Y plus plus every frame. Okay, so that works. It's like a teardrop. Um, and the reason wh why it's it's not uh, what we expect is because we're not clearing the canvas. But I'll make a snapshot of this so you can follow if you want. Number five. So um, before we do anything, before we draw, let's clear the canvas. And the, the function for that, there's a function for clearing it. Uh, it's called clear rect. And clear rect takes as input x, y, width, and height, just like draw rect or fill rect. Uh, so zero, zero. And we want to clear the whole canvas every time. And so luckily the canvas element has a width and a height property that we can use. So it's canvas.width, canvas.height. Uh, whoops, I mistyped. Height. So if we do this, oh, canvas is not defined. Uh, why? Oh yeah, I called I called it canv. Right. So yeah, width and height is available on the DOM object, not the canvas the not the context. I don't think it's available in the context. I could try it. Let me try it. Yeah, it's it's not the right. So canv dot width and canv dot height. 
So now we get we get this animation, which is what we wanted. But uh, what's wrong with it? It, it goes off the page, uh, and it's also not accelerating. So what I had in mind was a ball that is uh, bouncing. Like if you drop the ball, it accelerates, then it bounces off the floor, right? So I'll make the code a little smaller so we can see the whole thing. So this is the whole program. Oh, the code? You want to see that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. So here we have the whole program on one page. Um, request enum frame schedules that function to be called 1 60th of a second in the future. So, uh, and it implements, you know, it's probably not a recursive implementation because it's on the next tick of the event loop. So you're not getting, it's not really a recursion. No, uh, it is still cranking. It is still cranking, yep. So, so. In the program that I'm going to write today, it's going to be animating forever. But if you want to write code where the animation stops, the way you would do it is, you know, if keep going, then call request animation frame. Because it's your code that's scheduling itself to be executed in the future every, every time. So if you have some condition where you want to stop the animation, like actually we could do that, where just to demonstrate, if, uh, if y is greater than canv dot height minus radius just so we can see it otherwise we won't see any difference um, so again I'll close the HTML page so we can see everything here oh yeah it's not doing anything now while y is less than Oh, I have to save it. So now it stops. Hey, I'm some more realistic now, actually. <laughs> right, that's right. So clear rect actually clears the image data of a specific sub rectangle on the canvas. So it's like an eraser tool. It's like an eraser yes. tool. Yeah. yeah. And actually, I think if you put a canvas on top of other elements, if you call clear rect, it makes it transparent, rather than calling fill rect with white, which would make a white thing on top. So I think you can have like semi-transparent canvases. I haven't tried it myself, but it, yeah, it'd be like Photoshop layers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you have, <laughs> it would. If you have canvases positioned on top of each other, um, and you you can also use a canvas. You can make a canvas but not put it on the page and use that as an off-screen buffer and then draw that canvas onto other canvases. That's how you do double buffering if you want to. I mean, double buffering is implemented sort of for free, but if you want to do things like cache the stuff that you've drawn in a bitmap and draw it many times, like sprites in games, for example, you can make a canvas and draw the sprite to that once and then draw those pixels on to the canvas every frame. It's, it's much cheaper than like you know, drawing the whole thing every time. I'd like to sort of reorganize the code so it's a little bit more... So what, what I want to do is I want to have a circle object that has these properties, rather than having these global variables, because eventually we're going to want to have multiple circles, right? And so the way you make objects in JavaScript is... Oh, whoops. Is with curly braces. So if you open your... Uh, JavaScript terminal, you can just type var x. I'm just doing this to demonstrate how to make objects. So this makes an empty object, var x equals curly braces, and uh, foo is the key, and bar the string is the value. And key, keys and values are separated by colons. So if I have this statement, var x equals uh, foo colon bar in, in curly braces, we can now type uh, x.foo and get bar 
back out. So it's a way of just packaging things up into objects. So in JavaScript, objects are just key value pairs. They're like hash tables in other languages, hash maps, uh, dictionaries. If you wanted, say you wanted to have 10 circles, and you didn't, want, you didn't use objects, you would do something like var x's equals an array, y's equals an array, uh, radiuses equals an array, and then to make a new circle, you would add elements to each of these arrays, and then each index in the array would represent a circle. Right. And if you wanted to remove a circle, you'd need to remove all the stuff from each of these separate arrays, right. which is kind of, I mean, it's doable. You can do it with that way. And if you, if you look at C code or some of the examples uh, on the processing website, they use that sort of style. But I just prefer the object-oriented way, because like, I think the code is more clear, actually. So instead of having these variables, I'm going to make a circle object. var circle equals an object. And, and I'm going to put this stuff inside it. Uh, x colon, I'm going to use the same values, 50, y colon 50, radius. Uh, gets 20. So this is an object literal. I'm going to remove these global variables x, y, and radius. And then down here in the code, wherever I access those things, I'm going to use circle dot. So instead of y plus plus, it's circle dot y plus plus. Uh, instead of x, it's circle.x, y is circle.y. We're declaring global variables canvas, c, and circle. Okay. And execute frame. Those are all global variables uh, on the page. Well, Let's do a little test. Instead of adding 1 to y each frame, I'm going to add 0.1. So it's going to move more slowly. Or oh, yeah, radius is not radius. defined. So Oh, why? Where, where's why? Uh, here, circle dot. Why? Oh, it's all over the place. One more. So now it's moving slowly, see? And to demonstrate your question, are these things that we're using in the same namespace as the things in the JavaScript console? Yeah. So if we type execute frame equals an object. Oh, it already stopped. Let me refresh. Uh, it stops. See? And it tries to call that object as a function and gets an error. So yes, they're all in the same global namespace. And uh, yeah, one thing that we can do, and you should always do, unless you're making toy examples like this, <laughs> is uh, make an immediate called function uh, like this. Define the function in the first parentheses and then call it with the second parentheses. This is the form of an immediately invoked function. And if you spread this out and declare it, these variables inside of it like this, then these variables are scoped to within this function and they're not global variables anymore. And all reasonable JavaScript libraries do this. And you can return something and say, like, var, you know, my lib equals the result. And then you just get one variable for your whole library where your API goes. That's a common pattern in JavaScript. Yeah. When you do that, you just put the var cam, but what about the other variables? Yeah, right now this program's going to break because they're not all in the same space. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move them all into here. So I moved them all into that immediately called function. See at the bottom, it gets called right here. So now everything should work as it did before. And it does. And now, if we, if we execute this code, it doesn't have any impact at all, because we're defining a global variable. And the previous execute frame variable is scoped to inside of this function 
that's immediately invoked. So yeah, that's how JavaScript scoping works. The scoping is lexical scoping uh, on functions. If you define a for loop, it's not really a, a new scope. So that's a, a little thing to be careful about that's different from other languages. Um, so let's move forward with the, the physics and stuff. So I want it to continue animating. So I'm going to remove this line here. Oh, first I'll make a, a snapshot of this. Number eight. So how should we implement uh, the physical nature of the circle, where we want to have it like falling down with some kind of acceleration? Velocity. Yeah, velocity is the key thing here. Because meters is a concept in human space, but we're talking about pixels. It's going to be like pixels per... Ah, yeah. So let's define gravity. As a, a number. Yeah. Gravity equals uh, 0.1, say. And we're going to use it later on. So to give... We're gonna, yeah, you, you had the right answer, Frank. Is uh, you, We're going to need to give each circle a velocity vector. <clears throat> it's moving in a certain direction, and it's at a certain point. So we need to add new members to this. So I'm going to call it um, vx and vy. I'm going to make a comment here. vx and vy. The, the, is the velocity vector. So I've got Vx and Vy, and I'll start them both off at zero. So it's, it's not moving initially. But each frame, what we should do is increment the location of the circle by its velocity. So I'm going to get rid of that line of code before, that we had before that just increases y. And I'm going to say uh, circle.x plus equals circle dot vx. So we're adding the velocity to the location of the circle. Circle dot x plus equals circle dot vx. And then the same thing for y. And then we, you know, it's, right now it's not going to do anything because the velocity is zero and it's never changing. But what gravity does is it add, it's a continual acceleration downward. So to implement that, we can just add to the circle's velocity in the y direction, each frame. So each frame, I'm going to say uh, circle dot vy, the velocity in the y direction, plus equals gravity. So now it really looks like it's falling down. So what's happening is this, this animation loop is executing at 60 frames a second the whole time. The speed of the actual updating is not changing. But what's happening is the, the velocity, vy, on the circle object is increasing every frame by gravity, which is uh, 0.1. So if we make it 0 0.01, it'll go more slowly. And then every frame, since we're increasing the y location, by the y velocity, and the y velocity is getting bigger and bigger each frame, the amount by which the circle is moving down each frame is increasing. Yeah, if we make gravity 1, it just falls right away. Oh, why does it feel continuous? Actually, it's not, because it, check it out. If we don't clear the rectangle, we can, we can see the discrete nature of it, see the discrete steps. See, that's the magic of animation. See, if we make gravity 10, we can see it's a bunch of discrete steps. Okay. But because it's 60 frames a second and our eye can't really see things that change uh, faster than that, it seems continuous. Okay. So that's like the magic of graphics, right? Yeah? Is that the like, the defaulted container? That yeah, I was just about to address that. So it, it has the canvas has some size that we didn't specify. It's 300 by 150. Okay. And that's like the default size that we get. And actually, 
I'd like to change it so that it's bigger, so we have more space to work with. Uh, so we can go into the HTML page and define a width and a height on the canvas tag to change it around. So width equals, um, let's say 400. Height equals 400. So now it falls uh, more. Uh, this line here. That's what you see. Actually, your eye can can see the discrete steps now. The next thing I want to implement is bouncing. So it just falls down right now and goes off the page. Right after we in increment gravity, let's let's make it bounce off the bottom. We want it to bounce when it's gone off the screen, right? So we're going to have an if if condition, like if it's gone off the screen, then make it bounce. So if it's gone off the screen, so if circle dot y, keep in mind y is the center of the circle. Yeah, good call, plus the radius. So if the y plus the radius is greater than canv dot height, then uh, we could we could do we could flip the velocity, right? Circle dot v y equals times equal minus one, right? To invert it. But just to make it super clear, I'm going to say uh, math.abs, like the absolute value of its current velocity, and make it negative. Because the other way of implementing it has an assumption that it's come into this region of being outside the canvas because it was inside the canvas before. And if you just reverse it, it'll go back in, which may not always be the case. So like just to, to be safe, this is how I'm going to implement it. Right. Equals. The velocity equals itself negative. Yeah, good call. So it's falling. All right. Hmm? What's that? Yeah, it bounces all the way up, right? It's not how physics works. So I'll just make this comment. So yeah, it's a good comment. This is not really realistic because the ball goes back up to the same spot every time. Right? But hey, it's a bouncing ball. Oh, it's going higher. <laughs> Why is that? Because <laughs> really what we're doing here is approximating an integral with a discrete, like a numeric computation. So this is the error that results. And it compounds over time, I think. So anyway, we wanted to slow down anyway over time. So I'm going to introduce a factor. So we can multiply the velocity of this thing by a factor every time. And that factor can be slightly less than one to, to make it kind of slow down. Um, so I'm going to call that uh, dampening equals uh, 0 0.9, let's say. So slow it down. Uh, circle, what I'm going to do is multiply the velocity by that dampening factor. Circle dot vy times equals dampening. So if I do this, it's like it's like uh, if you jump out of a plane and you reach the fixed velocity because of the wind resistance. <laughs> it's just like that. 
See, it's it's reached a constant uh, speed because that, it's like it's where gravity and the dampening sort of I don't know intersect or something. Terminal velocity. So I'm gonna make this like point nine. I'll put make it point nine nine. See what that does. It'll bounce. Okay, that's that's more reasonable. It's it's like a ball. It's slowing down. Eventually, it's gonna stop. Oh, we should do this in both directions, even though it's not moving in the x direction yet. You know what might be the the issue is uh, when it bounces. It's going actually slightly below the canvas and then reversing the velocity and then incrementing that velocity. But instead, if, if uh, when we detect that it's reached the bottom, if we set it to be exactly at the bottom, I don't think we'll have this behavior anymore. So if we set circle.y to equals, to equal, uh, Canf dot height minus circle dot radius. Then let's let's see. Oh, it's going to take some time. Well, not too long. Let's see what happens. It should stop. Here, I just updated it. But anyway, this bouncing behavior, I you know, I find it acceptable. <laughs> Even though it's a little weird, so let's let's add some interactivity to this. Uh, let's make it interactive. So, at the bottom of the page, uh, before I start the animation, I'm going to add a mouse listener to the canvas, where you can get the mouse events. And the, the way you do this is uh, canvas dot add event listener. And add event listener takes two arguments: the the name of the event that you're trying to listen for, which in our case is mouse uh, down. Let's say when you click the mouse down, you'll get this event. And the second argument is a function. Is it oh yeah, canv. Right. I keep doing that because I usually name it canvas. Um, the function will take an event object, I'll call it E. And then on that event object, you have uh, properties called page X and page Y, which you can access and get the location. So console.log is how you print to the console. E dot uh, page X. I'm just going to print the result so we see it's working. Uh, I'm going to go over here and make this smaller. We're listening for mouse events. Okay, it worked. So I added this mouse listener. I refresh the page. Now when I click on it, you see it outputs these numbers, which are the pixels where my mouse is when I click. So if I click right here, it's going to be like 5, 4, because it's right there in the corner. If I go to the right, the X value will be bigger. And if I go to the bottom, the Y value will be bigger. So, like, we have this. We have a function get, that gets called every time we click. So, something simple we could do is set the circle to be at where the mouse is. So, circle.x equals e dot page x. And the same thing for y. So it works. We can we can move this. We can like teleport the circle, but it still has the same velocity. So notice if it's moving, it'll keep moving. And if it stopped, it'll you know it'll be stopped. But hey, it's basic basic interactivity. So instead of uh, setting setting it to be where the mouse is, let's pull it toward the mouse. I'm going to make variables that compute the difference in the location between the circle and the mouse, and then use those. I'm going to call them uh, dx and dy. So var dx equals uh, 
circle.x minus e dot page x. And the same thing for uh, dy. Yeah, question? E, e is this thing here that, that you get in the function. It's the event object, the and mouse it's, event. It's an argument, right? It's an argument to the function that you call, that you pass into the add event listener function. So, yeah, so this is, this is function, functional programming. You're passing a function as an argument to another function. Yeah. So we're pa it's called a callback function. So we're passing this callback function to the add event listener mm -hmm. function. And our callback function gets called whenever we click the mouse. Oh, that's part of the DOM API. That's part of the, the web browser, like the way web browsers uh, have that information available to you. Mm -hmm. And there are actually lots of different properties on these event objects. Like, watch this. If, if I say console.log e, and I just print out that object, I'm going to click. I get this object, and it has all this stuff in it. Uh, it's got client x, client y, layer x, layer y, offset x, y, screen x, y, and an x, y. But I did a little bit of research into this, and different browsers have different sets of these things, and the one that is common to all browsers is page x and page y. It's most reliable. So that's why I'm using page x and page y. The reason why the up and down behavior is weird because it, the, the velocity doesn't change. You know? The velocity stays as it is, just the position gets changed when you click it. So it's going to keep going whichever direction it was going at the time that you clicked. So now I have these differences and we can add the difference to the velocities of the circles. Circle dot vx plus equals uh, dx. So let's think about this for a second. If the mouse is to the right of the circle, then page x is going to be greater than circle dot y, uh, circle dot x. So actually, I think I want to re reverse this because uh, I want it to be a, a positive value when when the mouse is uh, to the right. So it's at page, page x minus and page y minus circle dot y. So same, same thing for y, and then let's see what happens. Whoa. All right. So it's taking the pixel difference and adding that to the velocity. And the pixel difference is maybe like 100 if it's like halfway across the canvas. Uh, but we want to make it a lot smaller because the velocity is on like a smaller range, smaller scale. So let's add a variable at the top called uh, pull strength, which is we're going to multiply the difference by this number. Equals, make it, let's make it something really small like 0 0.01 and just see what the effect is. dx times pull strength. Because it flew off the screen before. That's, okay, now it's more reasonable. So now it's going, it's going in the direction that we pull it. But notice we have to click every time. Wouldn't it be nice if, instead of having to click every time, if we hold it down, we would be like pulling that ball with a rubber band. You know, and as we hold it down, it would be getting pulled toward the mouse. So that's the kind of interaction that you might want to implement. So this is, I'll, I'll show you, I'll work through how to do it. Um, the way to do that kind of thing is, well, first of all, I'm going to stop for a second and see where everybody's at. I'm going to make a snapshot. Yeah, we got to, let's do that first, actually. Let's make it bounce off the sides. So bounce, uh, what we have here is the bottom. And we can copy and paste this code. I mean, this is dangerous sometimes, but I'm just going to do it. I'm going to do a search and replace all the x's with y's. So 
otherwise get, whoops, otherwise get x, and all the heights get width. And the logic is exactly the same, whoops, uh, for bottom and right because uh, it's, going po it's going in the positive direction. So this should bounce off the right wall. All right, it works. But now the left wall, it's not bouncing off the left wall. But actually, now that you mentioned that ghosting idea, I can't help but show you this really cool trick. Uh, instead of clearing the rectangle, if we fill a semi-transparent rectangle, we get a really cool effect. Uh, let's 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 play with it. Um, so instead of clear, I'm going to call fill, and it's going to be black by default. So we have to set the color to be white, a transparent white, before we call this. Um, C dot fill style equals oh yeah it's a T thing and this is a CSS color string that you can use I'm going to make it RGB A 255 255 255 which is red green blue in the range 0 to 255 255 is uh, as bright as it can be so this is white and then the last one I think you give it a floating point number, and yeah, it's opacity. So if it's like 0.2, let's see what the effect is. Uh, I'm not seeing anything. Oh, it's because we set the fill style here, but when we draw the circle, we don't set the fill style back to black, which we need to. So it's drawing the white circles as white. So um, before we call uh, C dot fill. We have to set C dot fill style equal black. Remember these colors are from CSS. CSS defines how you can specify these colors. So black is like known to CSS, so we can use it. All right, now we're getting that cool effect. But if we set the uh, fill style to our point. 0, 0.05, let's say. So now, is it like kind of drawing white circles behind it? Yeah, it's actually a string. It's weird. In JavaScript, to define colors, you need to define strings. And then the string is like parsed as a color. It's like a CSS. Yeah, CSS color string. Yeah, and it seems kind of silly to me because you're allocating new string objects every time you need to set the color. That doesn't seem right. So I think you guys could figure out how to make it bounce off the top and the left, right? Yeah, I'll update that. 13. So before we leave, I, I want to make some really cool looking graphics. So instead of having one circle, let's have a bunch of circles. So instead of a circle object, I'm going to make a circles array. Circles equals, yeah, an array of circle objects. So this is how you define an array in JavaScript, these uh, opening and closed square brackets. And then there's a dot push function on arrays where you can pass it uh, an object. And it's going to push this single circle onto the array. Um, but let's let's put this inside of a for loop and add a lot of circles. Um, so I'll declare the variables we'll need for the for loop up here. And actually, I'll declare this variable together with the others. Circles, and then uh, com we need commas, not semicolons at the end. Um, I, which is the increment, and then num circles equals, say, 10. So let's do a for loop. For, for 
i equals zero, i is less than num circles i plus plus. And the reason why I'm not declaring var i here is because uh, that statement would kind of be lying to you in saying, oh, i is yeah, i is scoped to this for loop, but it's not actually in JavaScript. In other languages, it is, so it makes sense to put it there. But for loops don't introduce another level of scope in JavaScript, so that's why I'm writing it like this, so it's super clear that when you change i, you're changing actually a variable in the scope of the function. So I'm going to move this circles.push code in, inside the for loop, and I'm going to give it random uh, positions. So math.random is the random number function. It gives you a number from 0 to 1. So we can multiply that by canv.width and do the same for uh, y and use canv.height instead. Um, so we have assembled our array of circles objects, circle objects, but we haven't updated the code later on uh, to use the array. It's still looking for a variable called circle. But so so let's go through this function execute frame and put. Well, actually, it's all referencing the circle object. So what we can do is put the whole thing in a for loop. So remember we have a new scope here. So var i, um, oh wait a minute. Oh no, it's all declared globally. Hmm. Num circles is 10. But so let's let's use a local i and the global num circles. Yeah, num circles with an s on the end. So here we have this function execute frame and all this stuff inside. So I've added the for loop and then we can have a variable circle and circle gets set to uh, circles at i. And we can just take all this code that refers to circle and, uh, you know, tab over. So it's inside this for loop. And then we need to add the end brace for the for loop at the right spot right here. So now it should be applying the bouncing and the drawing and the gravity and everything to each circle individually, each frame. So let's run it and see what happens. Num circle is not defined. Oh, here in my first for loop, it's num circle. I should add an S there. There we go. <laughs> All right. Sweet. So it looks like it's pretty much working. See, if I click, I get an error. So that code I did not uh, update. And also, notice something weird. These circles are different shades of gray. Why is that? The order of being turned up. It's because uh, in this code, we are clearing a rectangle for each circle, which we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be doing that. So I'm going to take this piece of code and move it out of that loop. So c.fill style, c.fill rect, I'll move that to outside the for loop there. Now they should all be the same shade of gray and have the trail, which they do. Uh, but when I click, I get an error. And the last thing I'm going to do is, uh, for this event listener, add that same for loop. 
And we need to be sure not to forget those variables. So I and circle. So now when we click, they're, they're, they're going to like go in all, all these different directions. Oh, can I read property X? Uh, right. We have to actually, yeah, we have to define dx and dy in terms of circle. But we can declare them up here. So now we've declared all these variables. And the difference needs to be computed separately for each circle. Oh, it doesn't work. Uh, oh, yeah, we need to define circle before we use it. There we go. <laughs> All right. So that looks pretty cool. So that's our lesson for today. Hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, I'll make it. GitHub.com slash current slash screencasts. Yeah, it's right here. Yeah. The way we do collision is we have an, another nested for loop. I mean, this is not the optimal way. So I'm going to de declare J here. And uh, go down here and add this for loop. And replace I with J. Get the square brackets right. And then inside here, um, well, I'm going to encapsulate it into a different function so it's easier to write the code for. I'm going to collide the current circle in the first for loop with the outer circle from the outter for loop, which would be, oh, look at that, CJR, Sejurkles. Um, circles at J. So I'm going to call collide for each pair of circles. But actually, you know, I should only call it for the upper diagonal of the matrix. Like, not, I don't want to call collide with the same object twice. You know, the same circle colliding with itself. So to do that, I'm going to set j, instead of equal to 0, j equals i plus 1. So <clears throat> this code will compare each pair of circles exactly once. So then I'm going to write the collide function over here. I'm going to name them A and B so it'll be easier to work with. So first of all, we need to compute the distance between these things. I already did a dx thing. Oh, but it's for a different stuff. So for dx equals b dot x minus a dot x, dy equals b dot y minus a dot y, and then I'm going to compute the actual distance between the two circles. Uh, I'm going to call it d equals the square root of uh, dx squared plus dy squared. This gets you the distance between them. And if the distance is less than 2r, yeah, they're both of the radius, radii added together, then we do some something. So if d is less than a dot radius plus B dot radius. What do we do? Um, so to do to do this, we want to have the direction in which they are related to one another. Yeah. So to get this unit vector, I'm going to call it u x and u y. So u x is going to be d x divided by the distance that gives us the the y length, uh, x length of the unit vector. So that would be uh, dx divided by d. And uy equals dy divided by d. 
that the force after the collision? Well, this is just this, the direction that the force is going to go. Okay. This is a direct, it's a, it's a direction between the two circles uh, where the vector is of length one. Okay. So we're going to multiply that by some force that we're going to, well, I'm going to, I'm going to define it at the top of the file. Um, repulsion equals, uh, let's say, one. Let's, I, let's see what's it's too strong or too weak. I don't know. So if I say repulsion is one, um, go back to collide. Um, if if they are close to one another, I'm going to compute the. Well, I'm just going to apply that force to both of their velocities in op opposing directions. So, a dot v x. So I'm going to change the velocity of it, of a. A dot v x plus equals ux, which is the x direction of the force, times repulsion. And should I add it or subtract it? Let's see. So a dot vx minus equals this. And same thing for uh, y. And then that's just a. So now a is being repelled from b, but b is not being repelled from a. And by the way, this is not really how people do uh, collision. Collision detection requires all kinds of crazy geometry and stuff like that. This is like a simplistic way, but it, look, it has the same effect. We're, we're, we're applying a repulsive force against this particle system of these, uh, these balls. I'm going to do the same thing for B, but instead of subtracting, I'm going to add. So this should do the trick. Let's see what happens. Yeah, they're colliding, see? But they're not bouncing off the left wall. <laughs> so they're sort of disappearing on us. But it basically works. Hey, we could make them all different colors, too. That'd be cool. And different sizes. There are so many different things you could do with this. See, JavaScript is not as slow as people make it out to be. It's actually really fast. People implemented nice uh, runtimes for it, like the V8 thing, V8 engine, which is running here in Chrome. It's just like any, any object-oriented language where you, you need to watch out for creating new objects. That's the big uh, performance hit. So if you, just don't, if you don't create new objects, like I'm not creating any new objects each frame, well, except the new string object to set the color, but that's probably optimized out because it's the same string every time. But that's, in JavaScript, uh, garbage collection is what makes your programs run more slowly. That's like the, the main cause of slowness. Can you be with JavaScript? Uh, well, I don't think you can disable the garbage collection, because if you did that, you'd have the memory would just overflow and you'd run out of space. Oh yeah, how would you do the hold thing? Uh, I'll sketch the, the idea of the solution. So. On the mouse down function, you would store the fact that the mouse is down. And on the mouse up function, you would store the, the fact that the mouse is up. And you would use that in the loop every time. You could make a new variable bar mouse down, which is true or false. It starts off false. And then you have uh, mouse x, mouse y. And then when you know that the mouse has been pressed down, you set mouse down to be true. And, and you store away the mouse x and mouse y. So you'd say mouse x equals e dot page x and mouse y equals e dot page y. And that's all that that function would do. And then you add another listener for mouse up. And then all that does is set mouse down equal to false. 
All right. And then, then you have a function uh, interact or you know execute interaction that gets called. And then here, instead of referencing referencing uh, page x, you could reference uh, mouse x and mouse y. And then every frame call that execute interaction <laughs> code. I mean, the way I wrote it, it actually should work. Something bad is happening. <laughs> but that's cool. <laughs> um, the, the problem was I was executing the interaction code even if the mouse wasn't down. So if the mouse is down, then execute this stuff. There we go. Yeah, see, now that's what I wanted. So now I'm holding it down. Oh, but they're not following the mouse. Why is that? Because the, the mouse X changed, but it's still set to that. Yeah, so to, uh, to fix that, we can we can add an event listener mouse move and just reset the x and y so now i should be able to hold it attract all the balls and move them around that works i can like throw them against the wall So, yeah, that's how you implement this sort of continual interaction. You just keep track of the state of the mouse and then use that in your simulation every frame. Well, I'll make a snapshot of this, number 16. Well, thanks for coming, everyone. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Let me know if you have any you know, suggestions for how to do it better in the future.